For the last two years, I'm one of the founders of a company called Pixelpin. We're a, um, providing a, a sort of innovative authentication service for organisations, for businesses, to their consumers. Um, we've been going about two years. We started off in Cheltenham, actually, but we've um, mainly in London now. Um, and we've become quite well known in the London sort of startup scene. We were the first company to raise 150k on Cedars, crowdcube, crowdsourced um, money. Um, at the beginning of this year, we spent three months in the FinTech Innovation Lab in Canary Wolf, and we've just heard that we've got into an accelerator in um, San Francisco. So we, we're trying really hard to grow and become, um, become one of these sort of internet um, stars. Um, so I'm going to look at um, why authentication is important, some of the problems with the, uh, the current uh, solutions, and then just look at some of the alternatives that are coming along. And I'll also just say a few words about um, Pixelpin as well. So I'm just going to start off by talking about why do we need authentication. Well, I'm just going to use a very real world example here. Probably on your um, front door at home, you've got a lock and a key. And that, that uh, key allows you essentially access to, to, your, um, to your house. So that's something you have, it allows you access to your home. However, somebody could come to, that's not the only way into your door, somebody could ring the doorbell and you could say, I recognise this person, this is something I know, I someone I know, I trust this person, I'll let them into my house, so that's something you know. Or it could be someone you don't know, but they provide um, a piece of identification, utility company, and say, actually, I don't know this person, but I trust this credential here, and I'm going to say, because of this, I'm going to let this person to my house and read my meter. Um, another example is when you go to a cash point. You have something you have, um, a pin, um, a, a, a cash card, and something you know, which is a pin. And those two together, like a two-factor authentication, that allows you um, access to, to, to your money. It's worth noting that if you write down your pin, you essentially got two things you, 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 um, you have, and therefore you've just taken away the main security of, of, that, of that solution. Um, so, essentially, authentication, just like um, uh, entering your helmet, gives you access to transactions on the web, protects your organisational data, protects your things in your house. So what's the difference between authentication and identity? Well, people get these two things mixed up. If I have the key to, to, to a door, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm me. I could lend my key to my neighbour. They can come into my house, they're not me, but they've still got access to my house. So having the key doesn't know who the identity um, of that person is. And it's the same with biometrics. I put, um, obviously, Mark Zuckerberg here. Um, but biometrics doesn't necessarily prove who you are. It proves that you're a person with that particular biometric. So unless you've registered that in some way, we still don't really know who that person is. So registration, for example, is the biggest um, way of proving identity. Um, if I registered my fingerprints under your own email credentials, then I'd become you, and you wouldn't be able to stop me from accessing um, things on the internet. So uh, registration is, is probably a key weakness in, for identity. Some companies are trying to find ways of, of, of linking authentication identity. There's a number of companies trying to provide identity services. And I noticed there's a company, a fintech company in, um, called Asimo. They provide money transfer systems. And if you want to go above a certain limit, they ask you to scan your passport in. Um, take a photograph it and scan it in and send it to them. And if they're happy with that, if it matches your credentials, they'll, they'll raise your, your limit. So people are trying to find ways, but there's no real universal way of of, of, um, of identity. And just something else about authentication before I start is that um, authentication is obviously, um, it depends on, it's, it's not vanilla, I say that vanilla, it depends on what you're, um, what you're trying to access. And at the moment there's, there's different levels of security, uh, mainly if you're sitting at home you have probably two levels of security you're accessing the internet, you put, have a password, to enter sort of 99% of your websites. And you'd have a 
from your bank you'll have some sort of um, token that allows you to um, uh, access transactions maybe change a PAE things that are very important um, and then if you work in, a, in an organization many organizations to protect the enterprise have have to have tokens and things two-factor I would say at the moment that most um, two-factor solutions at the moment aren't very user-friendly and most user two-factor solutions have also been hacked um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the um, some of the issues so all good security presentations have a few good scare stories um, and uh, password breaches here are estimated at 200 billion pounds last year by Forrester which is a huge amount um, I've no idea how they rose at that but I think we've all seen just looking at the press where almost every well-known company you've known about has managed to lose their password database um, and then it's easy to access because there are so many passwords now so many people using the same password that the the solutions of, of, of um, uh, encryption um, and hashing just aren't, aren't securing that information anymore and it's easy to say well this is just something happening it's not very important but Target a big US company lost the personal data of 70 million um, customers the CIO and then the CAO both had to resign they reckon the total cost of recovery is going to be nearly a billion dollars and their cyber insurance security is only a hundred million dollars so a hundred million probably seen quite a lot at the time when they took out that policy but um, it's seriously not enough um, and the other thing is that we as users don't like complex logins. I'm just going to talk a bit about the problems of passwords, but 45% of transactions fail because of authorization problems, and the password solution certainly does not work in today's um, uh, society. Again, this is, this is a, there's lots and lots of stuff on the internet about this, um, but actually we're not very original in creating passwords and um, a lot of people might have thought that monkey was a really cool password but actually it's a very common password um, in fact um, somebody's access looked at six million passwords on the internet and it's not very hard to find databases of passwords um, and with 10,000 passwords you do, you've, you've got 99.6 percent of those passwords so actually of, out of six million um, passwords you only need a 10,000 to get nearly all of them and unfortunately 75% of those passwords are also shared with banking so any advice to you is always use a unique password for all your banking do not share that with anything else um, and often um, your, your site might be well constructed you think your site might be well constructed but it, it, it's like um, having a good lock on your door if your windows are, are wide open then that doesn't doesn't solve much problems um, so I find it surprising that something so fundamental to the internet is so broken um, and at the moment I'm going to have a look at some of the uh, some of the alternatives but I think it's worth saying that at the moment because of poor implementation of passwords a lot of um, companies implement passwords and they probably haven't changed it much in the last 10 years um, Hackers are now very sophisticated at um, hacking databases um, and there's um, the classic way of securing a, a password database is to, is to hash it, it's a one-way encryption so you can never un unhash it so it's obviously completely secure but unfortunately it's not if you've got six million of them you can sort them you can work out what the most common passwords are and then you can just look at look up table and find out what the what the the hashing code is so obviously you can do more than that you can hash and salt etc etc but most um, unfortunately most um, organizations haven't spent the time and effort required to secure our details and in fact even big companies like Tesco's um, that runs a bank and you know one of the biggest companies was getting a lot of sick in the press last year by security experts saying come on guys your system is so bad you need to do something about it they're trying to embarrass Tesco's into updating their systems because it was so poor um, 
just a quick word about entropy. This is not a very exciting t topic, but it's um, essentially how easy it is to guess your your password. Um, so essentially, it's done on a logarithmic scale. So it gives you an idea of comparing different different methods. Um, so a four-digit pin has an entropy of 13, and an eight-digit um, password has an entropy of 49. That's a theory, theory because if everyone could, could produce really wonderful complex passwords, that would be how it is. But we just had a look. And actually, probably the um, entropy of a, of a, a password is, is closer to what a, a pin is, 13 bits, because the, actually people don't use it. And actually the most common pin is 1111. Um, and I think if you ever picked up a card, you've got like a three or four percent chance of getting straight in on, on that. And actually, there's no real um, standard on what a good password is. So if you go onto Google or PayPal, they'll tell you whether the password's weak or strong. There's no actual, um, there's, there's no actual um, uh, um, agreement on all that. So what might, might be good on one site is, is, is poor on another one. So everyone has their own views on what's, what's strong and what's not strong. And just one final thing on, on passwords is that um, people use, despite the fact that there's lots of characters you can use, 60% of passwords use the letter E, for example, 55% um, use the letter A. Um, so what, what would be a good requirement? So I'm, I'm going to look here at mobile because um, at the moment the world is moving to mobile. If you talk to any business, they're trying to get their users onto mobile. Everyone wants to get people away from, they don't want to own shops anymore, they don't want people to ring them up, they want to do everything online on mobile. And mobile is probably where the biggest challenges there are in authentication, because um, entering a password into a mobile with a soft keyboard is like a nightmare, um, with autocorrect, etc, etc. So clearly, passwords will not survive the mobile, mobile trend. Um, and so I've just listed some, some things. I mean, everyone could have our own list, but clearly it's got to be secure. But I would contend it's got to be easy to use. If it's not easy to use, people won't do it. So, um, so there's some good, Google have got a good two-factor two authentication system, but it's just hardly ever used um, because it just means you've got to go out of the app, go and get a code from somewhere else, etc., etc. It's got to be accessible to everyone. Um, not only uh, accessible to like the top 5% mathematical people in the country, most people don't really care about security, it's got to be something that's, that's accessible. Um, it's got to be private, essentially you should have a way of maintaining your privacy from other people. It's got to be quite cheap, no one really wants to spend a lot of money on authentication. Um, the banks don't want to keep sending out um, tokens, they cost a lot of money, people lose them etc, they go wrong. And it's got to be reliable, it's got to work every time. You can't have false negatives and false positives. It's got to be a, when I log in, I log in. So I'm just going to go through some of the trends here. I mean, this is not a, a complete list. So social logins, um, biometrics, device logins. I'm going to look at something called the FIDO Alliance. Know your customer, which is like the sort of trendy thing at the moment. And then federated solutions in which case I'll talk a bit about PixelPin in that area. So social login essentially is a federated login, so um, if you log into a site using Facebook, essentially you're trusting Facebook to log in on your behalf. So you say, I, I trust Facebook to be my login, um, and, the, and, and everyone's happy. Of course it's a value exchange, because Facebook, for, 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 for an exchange of that service, they essentially extract all your personal information. Um, so you're essentially you're, you're, you're selling your personal information in order to have a, an authentication service. And that's true of all Twitter, um, LinkedIn. It doesn't particularly work well on mobile. Um, and I found that it's mainly pre um, prevalent on social sites um, and small sites. A lot of brands will never use um, Facebook and certainly enterprise and banks and things, etc. will never do that. One of the simple reasons is that probably 10 to 15 percent of Facebook accounts are false, and a lot of people just create face, false Facebook accounts just to log in. 
um, to maintain their privacy. And the other downside is the sort of small print on the T's and C's is that if you're a retailer and you use a Facebook login, then that information actually belongs to Facebook and not to you. So this is where it becomes more interesting, biometrics. So this is probably the, the sort of growing um, authentication. So we've got two here types, physiological, something you, you, about you, something you are. Um, and behavioural. So I would say that fingerprint is probably the one that's the most uh, caught everyone's attention with the um, Apple and now the Samsung fingerprint. They've made something that was in the past you had to have a specific piece of equipment stuck on the side of your desk. It's now actually on your device. I said before it's, it's without any registration it's actually um, it's not a an identity system, it's a simple login, allows you access onto your device. It's not perfect, it's been hacked, but probably to allow you to log into a, a, a device is probably good enough. In, in terms of providing that to um, a login to a, a service, it becomes very interesting then to do with um, risk. So if you're a retailer or a bank, do I trust my customers' devices to let them access my my services and it depends really on how big your bank account is on whether you're willing to take that risk so PayPal who don't really mind and they want people to come to them regardless are happy to take that risk banks don't, don't seem to be at all happy to take that risk the other one's interesting is behavioral so you might not be um, aware of it but a lot of organizations are starting to put keystrokes into their thing so how you type your password is being analyzed certainly on banks, um, the speed, the, the pattern, it takes about five, ten, five to ten goes before, before it, it sort of gets confident. It wouldn't stop you from logging in but it's providing a confidence to the bank so the banks are all working on risk. Is They're not black and white, is this person a real person or not? It's like do we think it's probably a real person and what are the likelihood it's not a real person or a robot or somebody else? So a keystroke is a way of being able to look in the background and decide whether it's um, a real person or not. Um, voice is also it's growing, so I don't know if you've tried to um, access some of the telephone services. Voice works um, is starting to get used. Voice obviously only works in certain environments. If you try to log in in this room during a lecture using voice, you probably wouldn't be going down too well, and, and certainly in a crowded cafes and things, it's not a great solution, but it has some it has some merit. Um, i just like to say one interesting thing about fingerprints um, is that I believe the police have about a million crimes where they have fingerprints and they don't have any, um, they don't know who those fingerprints belong to. So fingerprints are quite an emotional subject really because there's a lot of people who would like to get hold of people's fingerprints um, and I'm talking here about government, police, um, organisations. So it's a question of, of trust, I think, on fingerprints. Um, do you trust the organisation that you're giving your fingerprint to? So I think it's surprising that schools, for example, think they can fingerprint their children. Um, I find that an extraordinary thing. That fingerprint can't change. It's the only way you can get into America. And yet it's probably hold on some small Windows server somewhere in a, in a school. So I think that's, um, um, you know, I don't think that's good at all. But I think that... Um, it's a trust and a trust. We talked to a number of telcos and we haven't found any organisation that would be willing to put a fingerprint database in the cloud because it's bad enough losing a password database but if you lost a, a biometric database then you're definitely the business is down the cloud, down the, down the tubes um, because there'll be no recovery from that. So it's a very interesting subject um, and, and it's obviously for, I think for, for device login it's got a lot of merit, it's quick um, but you've got to decide whether, you, whether you'd want to do that. Um, I'm going to talk about... Okay, that's... <laughs> I'll come back to that. So I'm just talk about something called the FIDO Alliance. Um, Fast Identity Online. So this is a sort of mixture of um, taking the device login and taking it um, a step further. So FIDO was set up by... Um, I've got Ramish... Casapaluni and Michael Barrett, essentially PayPal-backed, and they've 
the theory behind FIDO is that you can have different authenticators on your phone, so there could be a PIN, um, a biometric device, you know, a facial recognition or a USB port or something. And, and, and they connect, the FIDO Alliance provides a set of specs that allows you to connect your, your device, your mobile device, um, to, to websites. And so when you log in for the first time, the, the website will say, I allow these type of biomet these type of authenticators. And then through a, a whole series of um, encryption steps, it will then decide whether, um, it, you, you can then decide with, if, if you've got that device on your phone, you can then log into it. So they're trying to sort of say, well, there's not a brave new world or one new solution. People are going to log in on whatever device or what, however they want to. And um, f the FIDO Alliance is set up to try and create that. The first um, version of the specs came out um, in February this year. Um, and there's a company in the States called Knock Knock Labs that's implementing the middleware. They've raised 30 to 40 million um, dollars in the States and they're frantically implementing these specs. So this is a few slides from, from the FIDO Alliance. And, and, and they're probably stating the obvious here that remembering one password um, is not per, per, per website is not possible or it's not a scalable solution. Um, I think we'd all agree with that. Carrying loads of tokens is not scalable. When we were dealing with the banks in the beginning of the year, they said that um, one of the big, I won't tell you which bank, it, but it's one of the big investment banks, one of their main customers walked into the like the CIO of the bank and, and with like a handful of tokens and said, you expect me to walk around with this lot to log in? I said, you know, I'm not doing it. You know, so um, it doesn't really matter who you are. No one really likes carrying around lots of these things. And so the, the whole purpose of this is, 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 to, um, is to allow something that can scale. Um, it, 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 it supports a broad range of authentication methods and it allows people to use whatever they feel comfortable with. And it also allows for different assurance levels. You could have multi-factor, so you could have um, a, a pin and um, a, a fingerprint, for example. And again, it maintains the privacy. It's keeping the authentication um, on the phone, on the device. And here's just a little diagram of it. This essentially says that you know you you, you have an authentication um, system, whatever you want to do, and it maps to the FIDO server and allows you to log in. Um, and it allows you to, to have different, different levels um, of, of security. So it's, it's new, it's probably not heard, you probably might not have heard about it before. It's something that will be um, probably hitting the news quite a lot um, next year, I'd have thought. Samsung claimed to have um, implemented Fido on their, on their S5, however the, 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 the specs are definitely in draft, so whatever they've implemented it's a very early version as the knock knock um, infrastructure is not in place either. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a good story for them. Um, just something about know your customer. We were talking to Pay, um, PayPal last year and they said we don't need logins. We know who, who the people are just by how they <coughs> behave on their device. And I don't think I believe that. But you have to be aware that when you have your device, they know where you are, their IP. Um, they certainly signature the device, say, 200 plus points on your device so they know whether you've been on your site before and um, the banks do this a lot of big organizations do this they know your history um, whether you've you, where you've been there before they also know your transaction history so when you start buying things they'll say has it whereabouts has this car been used before have you used it to buy anything in this area are you in a new town do you mean there's so much going on behind the scenes that you're not aware of you just think it would just putting in a few information and it all comes up with a risk, a risk score. So the Google world will be that actually we don't need to worry about authentication. We know so much about you. We know where you are right now, where you're going, what you're doing, what you like. If you buy something that you like, we know that's you. It's an interesting world, but I don't know whether some people might like that world, but it's, it's a world where um, essentially an organization knows so much about you that you don't need to, you know, don't need to identify yourself to it. That is, um, the, the Know Your Customer is a very big um, deal um, and there's a lot of money being spent in this area 
and it's certainly, whether you like it or not, is something that's happening behind the scenes. So I don't know how I'm doing on time. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk about Pixel Pin. So we're um, an authentication um, system. So three years ago when we started, security was like a very boring subject and no one was particularly interested in it. Um, now it's a very hot topic and it's one of the most invested areas um, by VC, certainly in the States. Um, and uh, we, we try to bring three things together. So authentication, the, the move to mobile uh, and the ease of use. So we've actually got a small team of five people, but we've got a, a, user, a user experience expert in that team. Um, and we've also um, using pictures because with Snapchat, Instagram, etc., most people are visual and typing in numbers and letters isn't, isn't natural. So this will be an example of logging with Pixel Pin. You come to your, your bank, you, you, you have a personal picture or a picture from um, a, uh, um, a, a gallery that we've selected. You have four points that you've previously selected. You just click on those on your phone and you're logged in. It's a very simple process. It takes take, take seconds. It's a cloud-based solution, so nothing's done on the phone. Um, and um, it's a completely private solution, so we don't, don't keep any record, we don't sell any information about where you've been, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's language um, independent. Um, so, you know, accessibility is important for any solution. Um, and also, it stops phishing. So, phishing is a big issue with passwords. So, you can have a fantastic 24 digit password, but if you put it into a phishing site, um, then that does, means nothing. So having a, a specific picture to you means it's very harder to, um, to um, fish. And also it's immune to the classic dictionary attacks that we're talking about on passwords. Um, and we've also found that using pictures is a very, um, the sort of websites like the idea of, of, of logging in with pictures. So we're working with TFL, Transport for London. They've given us the tube map as a picture to use. And so logging in with the tube map is, is an interesting, um, makes the whole experience of logging in a lot more um, interesting and personal. Um, you've got, you know, you've got your journey or whatever it is, and that's how you log in. And, and um, um, we're in commercial discussions with um, TFL at the moment. So I'll just cover quickly a few questions. How secure is it? Um, so there's a theory. Um, I don't think the theory means very much. I've already tried to prove that the theory and practice is very different. Um, but um, we've taken, um, but, but let's look, quickly look at the practice. So this is the, the gallery picture I said. And um, when we first doing this, everyone said, well, it's obvious where people are gonna press. They're gonna press the engines on the boats at the beginning. That's, you know, why do we need to have a conversation on where people are gonna press? But we've been collecting live information um, from people using this picture um, and it's not obvious at all where people are going to press. And so we've been doing a lot of work on looking at the entropy of pictures, real world pictures, how we actually work out what a good picture is. We're developing a traffic light system. Um, and I, th I think you can see that actually, and we produce white papers, we had to do a lot of security stuff with the banks. So we've got a lot of white papers now looking at the whole business of, of, of pictures and security. Um, one good thing about um, pictures are a lot easier to remember. So uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not wonderful at remembering passwords. I can remember one, two, maybe, and then I'm starting to struggle. Um, a picture is something you have something like a picture is an Abe memoir, and essentially it, 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 it evokes an emotional response. And so um, you find you can go back to something you haven't seen for a long time, and you think, okay, I remember this. Yes, and you can log in. So password reset is a big problem for many organisation and costs. So we can reduce those costs a lot. Um, and the other thing is that people actually voluntarily change their, their these are from stats from our, from, our, from our users. People voluntarily change their password. Um, and uh, we find that, we can't find any stats on how many people actually change their, voluntarily change their password. Most people only change their password when they've heard the password, pa the site's been hacked. Um, so software as a service. Um, and um, this is our sort of, um, you know, our way of selling ourselves. And I'm just going to finish with one final thought, which I think maybe fits in a bit about what 
you've heard before is that I think that the, the authentication issue has become more and more important. Um, the world's becoming more connected and it's not just devices. At the moment we've been talking about laptops and um, uh, mobile phones and tablets. We're moving to the world where we're going to have wearables. Um, you know, so people are going to be wearing rings and glasses and watches. Um, and then we've got the Internet of Things, so your fridge is going to be talking to things and your, um, your washing machine. And so the whole business of authentication is going to become more and more important. You don't really want your, your watch hacked. If somebody nicks your watch, can they log into your, <laughs> into your bank? Do you mean there's all sorts of um, difficult issues here? So I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's an area where we haven't really got a good solution. We've tried to come up with something that's essentially simple for users to use. And my, my final sort of point is that at the moment we're just sort of walking into a world where there's no one, there's no government organisation saying, well, actually, we need to be careful about um, know your customer or biometrics. You know, people are quite happy to collect biometrics and there's no, there's no um, safeguards anywhere on that. Um, a world managed by safeguards is not a very open society. It's like a science fiction world, which probably most people don't want to live in. So I feel that there's, um, for me, that's like a surpassing sort of philosophical message that it, it, it's, it's an area that we, I don't think that we've got a really good grip on. So thank you very much.